To the ancients, who lived largely outdoors, the stars were a mystery. They had no idea of their nature, their origin, or even their distance from the Earth. Starlight carries more clues than you would at first expect. By studying it and combining it with our knowledge of matter, we can gain an insight into stars. The first clue we notice is that stars vary in brightness. Is this due to a variation in distance or the amount of light the star gives out or both? Isaac Newton started by assuming the stars gave off the same amount of light as the sun. When their brightness was compared to Saturn, he realized the stars were huge distances away. No one had realized the universe was so vast. In the 19th century, telescopes confirmed what early astronomers had suspected. The closest stars appear to move back and forth against the more distant ones as the Earth orbits the Sun. This apparent movement, known as parallax shift, can be used to calculate the star's distance from the Earth. The further a star is away, the smaller its parallax angle. For stars more than 300 light years away, the angle is so small that not even modern telescopes can measure it accurately. So parallax angle is only useful for measuring the distance of the closer stars. By measuring the distance of stars from Earth, we can show that they give off different amounts of light. The stars of the constellation Cassiopeia illustrate this. They all appear to have the same brightness. However, they are different distances from the Earth. So the furthest ones must give off more light or be more luminous than the closest. Luminosity is the actual amount of light that a star gives off. What we see on Earth is a star's apparent brightness. In the Southern Cross, the closest star is not the brightest. So more distant stars have greater luminosity. Astronomers have always been intrigued by stars whose brightness varied over time. They found that some are binary systems where a dim star eclipses a bright one. Some stars are orbiting a black hole with gases being pulled off in great streamers. They are distorted and therefore brighter from one angle than another. Stars like the Sun vary their luminosity. Every 11 years, sunspots increase their activity and the Sun becomes slightly brighter. Cepheid variables vary much more than the Sun. The Cepheid's period, which is the time it takes to complete a cycle, is directly related to its brightness. The ones that are the brightest vary the slowest. Using various methods, astronomers worked out the approximate distance of certain Cepheids from Earth. This made it possible to calculate the distance of any other Cepheid by looking at its period and its brightness from Earth. So, if we want to know how far away a cluster is, we look to see if it contains a Cepheid. The next clue we get from starlight is colour. With time exposure, astronomers saw that the colours of stars are subtly different. The question was why? 
when they looked at the stars through a prism, they could see their spectra. In the spectra, they saw something they recognized. The spectra were produced by bodies of different temperature. So, a star's color tells us its temperature. This is the spectrum of a red star. It's the same as the spectrum emitted from a gas that is red hot. The spectrum of a blue star has most of the energy in the blue to ultraviolet region. The star is blue hot. The hotter stars are much brighter. The sun is yellow hot at 6,000 degrees Kelvin. When we look more closely at the spectrum of a star, we see black lines where some colors are missing. These are Fraunhofer lines, named after their discoverer. This is an absorption spectrum. If we heat up an element, it gives off distinct wavelengths of light that make up what are known as emission spectra. They are the unique fingerprint of an element. The black lines in the absorption spectra from the stars exactly match the emission spectra of their elements. So the Fraunhofer lines tell us which elements are in the gases surrounding the star. Astronomers first examined the spectra from the Sun, they found that it is made of hydrogen and helium. It seemed reasonable to assume then that the energy of a star somehow came from these elements. They quickly worked out that the energy comes from nuclear fusion reactions. Gravity increases the pressure and temperature inside the core of a star until hydrogen protons fuse together. Then one of them decays to a neutron. Another proton fuses forming helium-3. Then two helium-3s fuse to become helium-4. In this process, some of the mass is lost and converted into a vast amount of energy by radiation. This radiation and the expansion of the hot plasma balance the contraction caused by gravity. The fusion reaction happens only in the core where it is hot enough and the pressure is immense. High energy gamma rays are given off but they cannot go straight out to the surface because they bounce around randomly inside the star. It may take 10,000 to 1 million years for the light to eventually reach the surface. In this time, the wavelength changes to mainly visible light. In small stars, where there is relatively little gravitational pressure, fusion produces only red heat. A mid-sized star, such as the Sun, is yellow hot. A blue star is more than ten times the mass of the Sun. Under huge gravitational pressure, the fusion rate is extremely high. The star becomes blue hot and each square meter is far, far brighter than the same area on the sun. On top of this, it has a much larger surface area. Each blue star in the Pleiades, for example, has 20,000 times the luminosity of the sun.